Good afternoon, everybody. How's it going? Good, good. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we're ex very excited to be hosting this event um, and getting all of these like-minded people together uh, to hear what, what Sean has to say today. Um, so just on behalf of Union Bank and Union Bank's Catalyst, thank you guys for attending. Um, keep your eye out for more events like this coming into the future. Uh, I just took over Catalyst. If you don't know me, I'm Tullin. I took over in May when I graduated. So we're, we're continuing to find new ways that we can interact in our, our community and ecosystem by bringing in speakers like Sean, um, and then just continuing to develop out the resources that we have at Catalyst. If you guys don't know, the, the community space is free for you guys to use for whatever you need, uh, whether that's meeting with investors, uh, just doing group workshops, you name it, this space is free to use. If you have any questions about that, please ask me after. Um, we're also a banking resource being tied to Union Bank. So if you ever have any banking needs, that's something that, that I'm also responsible for and can take care of. Um, and like I said, we're continuing to find new ways that we can help entrepreneurs and, and their banking. So if you guys ever have any suggestions, come to me. Um, we're always kind of evolving and seeing what we can do in the community. But with that, I, I'm very proud to introduce Sean Shepard from Growth X in, uh, from the Silicon Valley. We brought him out here to partner with InMotion and Catalyst. He's the lead instructor at Growth X Academy at Galvanize and a five-time selling founder and serial entrepreneur that has grown multiple, multiple companies from the startup phases. He's an expert in sales and marketing and currently heads up the sales and marketing portion of the Growth X Academy um, partners in Growth X. His background includes growing a company from just four employees or three employees and 200,000 in sales to over 40 employees and 5 million in annual, annual revenue a year, excuse me. Um, he's also recently named the top 20 sales influencers of 2016. So I, I think with that resume, and I could probably go on even more, that's just the, the blurb that I got. <laughs> we can keep going, yeah. Um, we're very honored to have somebody like Sean in the community as a resource, um, and to be able to show him what's happening in Lincoln, it's pretty special. So with that, Sean Shepard, thank you. Thank you. It's always great to get the applause before I disappoint. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Josh Berry is a friend. Uh, we've done business together in the past uh, in a prior life, and um, we've stayed in touch, and he's been sharing with me what you guys have been up to here. And it sounds really exciting. Um, and, uh, and when he asked me to come out, I said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so I really enjoy doing this. I travel all over the world doing these kinds of things these days. I'm the I'm the lead SDR for GrowthX, I say. Um, my job is to go out and attract founders, funders, and great talent into the GrowthX community. And, um, and I couldn't be happier uh, doing it. And, and what I've seen so far in Lincoln, I think the last time I was here was probably in the early 90s when I was a young uh, touring golf professional who would go anywhere to play for a paycheck. And then accidentally transitioned into tech, and the, the last 20 years have been, been wild. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about a little bit more about our background and what GrowthX is. As you said, I've started five companies. I've had three wins and two valuable learning experiences over that period of time, um, and that's what it is. It's not failure. It's only failure if you don't learn from it. Um, more recently, after building and, and exiting Talent Circles, which is now kind of the market leader as an enterprise talent acquisition CRM uh, company, in May of 2013, I built a startup MBA program for a little program called Tradecraft in San Francisco. It took a year and uh, helped develop a lot of non-technical talent that wanted to transition into tech that didn't want to code. And um, as a selling and marketing founder and a market development guy who's always been fortunate enough to recognize that I'm not technical, I can't even spell HTML. Um, but what I do know is how to take a product or a service or a technology and help other people be successful with it. And that ultimately is what it's all about. Your success will come from helping other people be successful. And if you remember that and you enter every conversation, interaction, and opportunity in your business and life with that attitude, um, you'll see the success that you want to see. I promise you. Um, so along that line, um, 
uh, I got together with a couple of guys that I met through that program that were also uh, founders of companies that had come to the Valley, uh, built companies in other places, um, and we launched GrowthX as a, as a fund initially, a $50 million seed stage fund. And the first problem we faced was venture capital was broken. Um, the traditional model for venture capitalists is, is they, they, are, they earn a 2% management fee every year uh, for the money that they manage to help the companies that they invest in. So as a seed stage fund, if I give you $100,000 for your, invest $100,000 in your round, I'm paid $2,000 a year to care. Um, which works for other people, it doesn't work for us. Uh, we are all founders with market development expertise that wanted to help seed stage companies get to break even or to an A, Series A round with, uh, with, with the maximum valuation possible and the right people and a repeatable, scalable, predictable business model. Uh, so we couldn't do it that way. So we had to come up with another way of doing it. So one of my partners who's an amazing lawyer, uh, we'll talk about them in a minute, um, worked on a structure that allowed us to um, restructure the way venture capital is, 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 uh, is, is raised and deployed. And as a result, we were able to put an acceleration team in place that helps companies in our fund accelerate growth uh, and do it for additional equity without having to raise a billion dollar fund and give you more money than you actually need to be successful. And as a result, we've had a lot of success with that in the last couple of years. And the last remaining stool or leg on that three-legged stool, if you will, between founders, funders, and talent is the talent aspect. Once we've helped a company grow and identify the market development talent that they need to help take their product to market and grow it, um, they need to be trained in the right way to do these things. They need to understand what it is to take a new company or new product to market. It's very different than working in a company with history and background and referenceable customers and full support and, um, and a history of, of success than it is to take something brand new. How many of us in here are startup people? Uh, how many of us have done it more than once? Uh, those that have done it more than once, am I, am I speaking the truth about the difference between working in a stage relevant environment, as we call it, taking a new product to market when people don't know you or your product or anything about you versus taking something that already exists? It's a very different set of attributes and requirements for founders and early stage uh, market development and product development people than it is to be in a later stage company. So we teach that, and we need to teach that to the people that want to work in startups. And institutional education is not going to do it. Um, every year, Gallup trots out the same poll at the end of, uh, during graduation season. They, 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 they pull college provosts and they ask them, um, you know, are, your, are your graduates ready for the workforce? And 90% of them say, of course they are. And then they turn around and they ask the business leaders and the hiring managers and the employers, and they, only one in 10 agree with them. So there's clearly a disconnect. Um, especially in liberal arts education. There aren't any job postings saying seeking liberal artists. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to end up somewhere. So where do people end up? Well, the data says that 50% of us end up in a sales or marketing related role with very, limit, very limited background education and experience in those roles, right? Tolan, you just graduated? Yeah. What kind of degree? Uh, marketing and entrepreneurship. Okay, did you take any sales related classes? No. Yeah, they don't exist, right. There's only 16 universities, that, to my knowledge, under the University Sales Alliance that even offers anything as a subset. I'm sorry? That's great. So they're working in that direction, and they need to. But the point is, is that the relevant education, knowledge, skills, and behaviors that you need to be effective in a non-technical role in an early stage company um, are not taught traditionally. A lot of them are character attributes. Can you embrace ambiguity? Can you communicate effectively? Can you talk to humans and engineers? Um, it's a joke. Um, <laughs> uh, do, you, you know, do you love technology, but you're not necessarily a technologist? Um, does the lack of structure and support motivate you or frustrate you? Those are the things that matter. Those are the things you hear about in, 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 in amazing books like Grit. Um, those are the things that you hear about when you, when, you, when you think about mastery and you think about achieving uh, success and per perseverance, determination, a growth mindset, uh, embracing feedback as a gift, not as a criticism. Um, 
here I made this, what do you think of it? Let's work together to see if we can make that happen. That's a totally different attitude and mindset than what we're taught in traditional education. And we're raised to check all these boxes. And we check those boxes and then we find out we're miserable. Um, and that happened to me too. I thought I was just gonna play golf my whole life. I had no idea I'd end up in technology, who knew? And it was accidental. And it often is for many people, but it actually can be a planned thing. And there are many skills and, and attributes that, and traits that people have that are transferable. So my, my goal is to continue to train and educate startups and talent that wants to work in those startups on the market development process and how to do this in the most capitally efficient way possible to get to the ultimate goal, which is the truth about whether or not there's somebody willing to pay you for what you do in a predictable and scalable way. And most people skip right over that and they don't realize it until it's too late. So this all works on a basic premise. And this basic premise is, is that we live in the age of applied technology. Um, for 60 years, Silicon Valley deified product developers and commoditized and minimized market developers. Uh, and that worked when there was defensible technology that was patentable. Um, how many people in here work in a company that's software related? Okay. If you're in a software related business, you're in an applied technology business. Uh, even more now than ever before. Since the Allison decision from the Supreme Court came down, especially, you can't patent software anymore. Um, your intellectual property is your insights into the business, not the technology itself. Your intellectual property is your team. Your intellectual property is your product market fit. Uh, it is not your product. Pro the two guiding principles of growth X are products don't create value, customers do. And great entrepreneurs shouldn't have to leave their hometown like Lincoln to go to the most expensive city in the world and be close to the capitalists to try and be successful when they can be at home next to their customers and their support system, which is why GrowthX is opening offices all across the globe in a lot of markets like this. We're already in Phoenix and Dallas and Nashville, and eventually we'd love to be in a place like this um, because there are great people like you who can build great companies and create value in the world and help us accelerate the world we all want to live in um, without having to, to do the Silicon Valley shuffle. Um, so today, because applied technology is so much more important uh, than developed technology, as we call it, which would be the defensible hardware-related items, um, the, the market development process, the, the expertise in market development is more important now than it's ever, ever been. And what you want to do is get away from the, the product being your risk and, and, and making the market your risk by focusing on the market itself. Um, and I'll give you an example. The first time I raised money, I raised eight and a half million dollars from Guy Kawasaki and the Garage Ventures Group in 1999 to build an MVP for a product that I could build today for 200,000 bucks. Because all the infrastructure exists. So getting a product to market has become easier than getting traction in the market. And that's completely flipped from what it was 15 years ago. And that's why all the requirements for raising money have changed. You used to be able to raise money in an idea, or on your history, um, or to fund development of something, but now you need to show traction and revenue. Otherwise, the only people that will invest in you are your friends and family. And that's okay, as long as you recognize that going into it. Don't waste your time and, and effort on raising money. Focus on making money. The best investors are your customers. They'll give you money and they don't want equity and they don't want control of your company and they don't want to call you every week and ask you how much more you sold. Um, they just want you to solve a problem for them. And there's nothing wrong with that. We need to return to the age of the bootstrap and actually build things that people want and will pay for, and then the money will come. So we focus on the seed stage the way that people used to focus on the A round. Um, now the, what used to be the A round requirements of having a certain amount of revenue and a certain amount of customers have become seed stage requirements. So we like to invest in companies that have early customers, early revenue, we're industry and market and product agnostic because while your product and your market are unique, and hear this, um, while your product and your market are unique, the path to product market fit is not. You have to do the same things. Uh, you may realize it or not, but the reality is, is that you need to check the same boxes. Um, and the problem that we run into is, is that founders remain product focused. And um, there's too many people that are buying the Steve Jobs nonsense that people don't know what you want until you, until you give it to them. 
Well, that works once in a blue moon, um, but it doesn't always work. And it's certainly not going to work in the age of applied technology. So you need to be market focused or you need to have a partner on your team that's market focused. And that partner needs to be stage relevant. You need to have this real conversation with them about, can you handle the stress of a startup? Every startup's a shit show. They're all, a chaos. They're all chaotic. The X in Growth X stands for exponentially effed up, <laughs> sometimes. Um, it's also exponentially fun. But if this is what you love, right? I know that I'm an entrepreneur. I get it. It's French for crazy person. I'm psycho. I get it. This is what I love to do, and I've embraced it. And um, it, get rid of the romance of it all and focus on whether or not this is something you enjoy. And if you do, and you find people like that, that know how to talk to humans and engineers, that love startups, those are your renaissance people, as we call them. Um, they're the people that can help you learn because the seed stage is for learning just as much as it is for, for the revenue and it has to be the right kind of revenue. And it's okay to be a service oriented business trying to build a technology product in the process. Because as I said, it's the insights into your business that you bring with the technology or insights into helping somebody else be successful that you bring with your technology that makes the difference, not the technology itself. So stop focusing on building product and raising money and start focusing on marketing product and making money. So our program, again, it comes for people that are already in our fund. Um, we make an investment first. We typically write checks between twenty-five dollars and $100,000. We don't lead. Uh, we, we invest at companies with valuations in that million to $10 million range, typically, at the time that they're raising. Um, and then uh, after that, once they're in the fund, we see how they behave because we're a people first organization. People behave very differently after you write them a check sometimes than they do when they're asking you for the money. Um, and then those that care more about our health than our money can apply for our acceleration program. And we've got a pretty awesome team that helps with those along with regional leadership. That's me, that's my partner, Will Bunker, who founded Match.com. He's from lower Arkansas, LA as he calls it. Grew up on a farm in, um, in Lake Village, Arkansas. And wanted to figure out a way to make money on the internet in 1995 and he looked at AOL and the chat rooms and he saw that the only thing people were using the chat rooms for was to get dates. Dates was a kind word. Um, and so he and his partner and their wives and their children started this company together and they've never had to use the product themselves. And they did it with only $90,000 in investment, by the way. They couldn't raise money. They did it in Dallas, Texas. Uh, it started out as oneandonly.com. And they eventually sold it for a ton of money, obviously, to IAC Ticketmaster. But every day on the board, what they did was is they put very quickly, simply on that whiteboard, most money, least work. This is what we're going to do today. This is how we're going to behave. So I'm going to give you some knowledge. And you've already got skills. But ultimately, what I'm trying to get across to all of you today is this is about your behaviors. This is about how you choose to spend your time. Every one of us has a limited amount of time money and people to spend on getting to a profitable, scalable, predictable revenue model. And you can't, don't take that lightly. So how you behave every day, we call it the traction effort delta. What can I do today that generates the biggest return with the least amount of effort? It's not called, it's not called being lazy, it's called being smart. Andrew Goldner from Cleveland, Ohio, who went to the University of Cincinnati and Georgetown Law and became a, uh, ran the tech practice at SCAD in New York subsequently became the chief tech counsel at DoubleClick, sold them into Google, and went to work for Thomson Financial and acquired Reuters and became the global publisher of Reuters for seven years out of Asia, is our partner who helped us structure the fund and manage it. Um, his, his talks and content in the GrowthX community on fundraising are, are legendary and awesome and elegant and simple. So if you need help with those things, he's got some great fundraising 101 talks that you can watch right on Venture Shift, which is our media platform. And then Russell Lewis, who was a biochemist from South Africa, who invented the truck bed liner. And uh, Rhino Linings, it's his company. 86 countries, does about a half a billion dollars a year in revenue. He owns it outright. Uh, and he does what we call growth ex exits. He, he focuses on M&A for our companies. You'll notice that none of us are valley people. I, I was born in Italy. I ended up in California. My dad was in the Navy. and then. Uh, I built companies in Arizona and Chicago and other places. Um, we all came to the Valley later and met 
because we had similar mindsets and ideas about how venture capital should work, how people should be helped, and what areas uh, where the talent was, was, was uh, where the gaps were. And it, we were all market people, we were not product people. Um, and then I've got an awesome MXP team, which is, stands for our Market Acceleration Program. Uh, Andy took Google Nest and Glass to market, so he had one win and one valuable learning experience himself. <laughs> Kendall Romine was a captain of the Stanford women's uh, soccer team, national champion, um, three Final Fours, U.S. women's team, played professionally for the Seattle Reign. Max is the Pitzer guy. I was talking to a Pitzer alum over here. Um, Two ex-Chinese, uh, these two repatriated, they were both um, English teachers in China. No technology experience, no background in it, none whatsoever. The same with all this entire team, except for Ryan, who's our lead growth hacker, and I call him boy genius in shorts. Uh, it's San Francisco, if anybody been in San Francisco in the summer, this guy wears shorts and a t-shirt every day, no matter what the weather is. It's crazy. Um, anyway, so they were perfect examples of non-technical people that wanted to work in tech. They had a love for it. They had a natural ability to talk to humans. And I worked with them for two years and got them into a place to where now they crush it every day for startups in our portfolio. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything else with their life. And those are the kinds of people that we want to develop with into GrowthX Academy. And then my regional leadership is my venture partners in, in uh, Nashville, Dallas, and Phoenix. And we'll be in New York before the end of the year. And we'll be in Boston. And then we'll start hitting other markets, uh, regional markets. Over half of our investments are outside of the valley. Um, half the unicorns come from outside the valley. But 75% of the money is invested in, in California, New York, and Massachusetts. And that needs to change. There's great founders like you. There's great companies, great ideas. I saw a few this morning. Um, in Brian Ardinger's uh, program and Josh Berry's program in motion, which is amazing. And, um, and there needs to be more of that. So there needs to be more help and more talent to be developed in those markets. So here's our approach, and this is the approach any one of you can apply, uh, apply to your business. This is not a pitch for GrowthX. What this is is a, is, is a methodology that we want to share with the world of, in the startup community for people to, to get intelligent and smart about how they get to the truth in the most capitally efficient way possible. We have a four-stage process. It starts with market discovery. Market discovery is the go slow to go fast stuff. Take your time to figure out who your best customer is now. Not a year from now, not 10 years from now. <coughs> I know the natural inclination is as we build a deck to raise money from investors and we tell them that everybody is our customer. But then we forget to go back to the pebble in our shoe and focus on who should be our customer now. Look for Mr. Right now, not Mr. Right. Um, Who's going to help you get to your next mile, market milestone? And what is your next market milestone? Is it five customers? Is it two pilots? Is it, is it uh, break even? Is it a certain amount of recurring revenue? Is it number of transactions? Is it learning to get, the pro to, get to a next product market milestone? What is it? Figure out what that is. And then make sure that who you go after and spend your time on in the interim meets that criteria. Because there's only one of you or two of you. There's thousands of people that you can do business with. So you, this is what I mean about behaviors. You have to behave in the same way, in the same diligent way as a procurement officer would behave in a company that you're trying to do business with. Do these people qualify for what I have to do? Can they but pay for it now? Um, do they have the authority to do it? Or will they work with me and give me the feedback I want on my product, depending on where I am and what stage I'm in? Make sense? Okay. So figure out who they are, where they are, and then layer on that old most money, least work thing. Right? What's the highest likelihood of winning this opportunity? What's the greatest revenue potential? How close is it going to get me to my next market milestone? How many resources do I have to allocate to that? And then back to that original applied technology slide, the risk becomes, are there more people like that? And if there are, great. Right? Then I can tell this story to the next person. Once you've figured out who those people are, or you've developed a hypothesis around it, and that's important, you shouldn't assume anything except responsibility for your own actions. Um, you should hypothesize everything. Once you figure that out, now how do you find them and how do you talk to them? Where are they? What do you say to them? Not to sell, but to seek fit. And this is where everybody goes wrong, and not everyone, but this is the big fundamental problem that, that, that most people have. Um, is they don't qualify people into their funnel. 
They just go after everybody that expresses interest. And you shouldn't do that. You have to be disciplined. Okay? And you can do this in the most respectful way possible. You have to start by creating a message that says, I hypothesize a certain value for you. So based on what I know about your business, I hypothesize that I can help you in this way. I'd love to have a conversation and know if that's the case. Do you have 15 minutes? And then you need to be focused on that 15 minutes and prepared. What do you do today? How do you do it? What are the problems associated with it? What's the resulting impact on your business? And do you have a need to change that? And can I fulfill that need? That's the context. That's the nature of the whole conversation. Did I mention a product? Did I mention a market? Did I mention a business or a widget? No. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with whether or not you can help somebody solve a problem and whether or not they recognize that they have that need to solve that problem. And if they don't, that's okay. You move on. No is the second best answer you're ever going to hear. Because wouldn't you rather know it now than six months from now? So be realistic about that. And that's a natural behavior that you can use to scale a business forever. It's called, I call it a conversational framework. So you build an attraction framework that says, that gets people to go, ooh, that's interesting, tell me more. I'm a little interested in what you're doing. I'd love to hear more about it. Then you get on the phone or you get in person or you have a live conversation and you say, here's what I do and the way, this is how I think I can help you. Um, do you have any issues with this? What's the problem you're facing today? Can we work together? Does it warrant a follow-on conversation? Because the outcome of that is all about obtaining a commitment to the next step. What do I do next? Should we, should we have a conversation? Should we continue to do this? And then if you do, you get very focused on qualifying them, not just for need, but for do they have the money or do they have the resources? Do they have the authority? Who else is involved in the process? What role do they play as an influencer or as a buyer type? And how realistic is it that we can do business in the time allotted for me to meet my next market milestone? You have to ask yourself and your team those questions. And you need to get hygienic about this. Because the reality is, is if you're selling something to an enterprise, you can only, one person can only manage five to, to 10, maybe 12 opportunities at any given time, right? You're selling to smaller businesses, you can only make, have so many conversations in a day that are meaningful, right? So be realistic about how you properly allocate your resources. So once you've done that, you've developed that messaging and you've reached out and you've created this opportunity to learn. And those conversations as you enter them are for learning. I'd love to learn if I can help you, okay? Once you've done that and you start to deliver results, now you start to look at the things, how do I measure the success of this, right? How do I do this? How do I functionally measure the results? Well, it's scientific method. We've all learned this in school at some point or another. This is one useful thing we can take out of institutional education. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, if there's anybody institutionalized in here, I apologize. Um, but the point is, is that you enter everything with a learn, test, measure it. If it works, keep it. If it doesn't, iterate until it does or get rid of it. And that needs to be your goal when you're trying to be efficient in this process. And if you enter conversations this way with, with authenticity and a genuine love for helping others, as I talked about at the beginning of this, then people will be amazingly honest and open with you. Nobody likes conflict. Nobody wants to tell you no. Uh, so oftentimes they don't. And then you bias yourself into believing that this is a thing here. Okay? Um, and you end up going down a, a, a bad path or waste your time in ways that you don't need to waste it. Um, so learn, test, measure, validate, iterate, yes or no. And then keep doing and scaling the things that work and the thing, not the things that don't. And this is easier and data-driven, you, especially if you're acquiring customers online through Facebook ads or Google channels or things like that, where you can do these real-time iterative data loops and get real-time feedback and constantly be testing and measuring things that way. It's tougher when you're in analog growth, as I call it, when it's human-to-human -human interaction. It's a behavior. You have to behave in a way that collects this data and you're constantly asking yourself because there are two genuine outcomes that we think about um, when, we, when we work with startups. And it's culturally, can you turn your, your company into a functional learning organization where everybody's on board with this idea that everything we're doing is trying to learn from the market so that we can build something that they want so we can stay in business. 
Um, and then two, how do you measure it through unit economics? Can I acquire customers for a lot less than it cost me to, to um, um, you know, uh, can, I, can, I, can I acquire them for less than they'll pay me? Excuse me, CAC LTV ratios. So those are the things that matter. Now this is, the, this is the mud, this is the dirt, this is the digital ditch digging that we do. And we do it together when we work with our companies. And it's in this order always. This is that path to product market fit that I was talking about. You take these steps, you go through resource review mapping and planning. Who's on my team? What resources do I have right now in terms of money and people? What am I going to need to execute on my next market milestone? And I'll share this with anybody, by the way. You can take pictures all you want, that's great. But um, I'll make sure Tullin gets a copy of this and you know, catalyzes it <laughs> through the community for, for you. Um, how are you currently doing marketing and sales automation? And what process, if any, do you have in place? Most people don't have a process, that's okay. Uh, but you have to have one at some point because you gotta start with a process because otherwise you can't measure it. It also depersonalizes things when you're holding people accountable. When you manage to a process instead of to a person, there are no surprises and you can both collectively sit down and go, What's happening? Are we doing these things? What's working, what's not working? Instead of, why aren't you doing this? Um, changes the nature of the interaction in the, in the conversation altogether. Then the, the sales, marketing sales technology stack review. Most people don't have anything, but if you do, uh, you need to make sure that, it's, it's, it's th that you can measure everything and have complete line of sight into every action and reaction and step and stage in your marketing and sales process. We don't move forward with any of our companies on outreach until instrumentation is in place. And sometimes that's painful and slow. <coughs> but so is you know, building the foundation for that building across the street from the hotel I'm staying in that nobody sees for the two years of planning and design and pouring concrete and digging holes and, and, and putting footings in place so that you have a solid foundation. It's called a foundation for a reason. Uh, otherwise, it's going to collapse at some point. And you'd rather do it the right way the first time, wouldn't you? My dad always said to me, do it right the first time so you don't have to do it again. Right? So take the time. Um, these are expected timelines. These are actually things that we do. We try to apply pressure to companies to get this stuff done as quickly as possible. It's market dynamics. Every company's different. Sales cycles are different. Um, how quickly companies respond is different, but those are just guidelines. Then we get into the current companies. When we do market discovery, if I sat down with you and you were gonna ask me what's the right customer for me, I'd say, all right, tell me about all of your current customers. Who are they, where are they, how did you acquire them? Uh, what, what do they say you do for them? Not what you tell me, I, don't, I, I like you, but I don't care what you think about your product. I care what the market thinks, right? So tell me, tell me that story. I do customer interviews with them. I get detailed and start building profiles. We call them ideal customer profiles. And then we start to stack rank and prioritize those profiles based on the ones that are going to be the best for you to meet your next market milestone. And then we get blinders on and we focus on those. And then we do this process with those until they tell us that either this is a thing or they tell us this is not a thing and we have to pivot to something else. And that's okay. Don't fire the plan, you know, you fire the plan, don't fire the people. It happens all day long, right? We, we create a hypothesis, we test it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, that's okay too. And it's just as much attitude as it is anything else. Um, then we look at that current customer journey, the UX and UI. Um, how do people do business with you is super important, whether it's online or offline. What steps do they have to go through? Have you made it easy for people to do business with you? Because the hardest thing to do is make something easy. It really is. It really is. So can you deliver that kind of experience that Amazon has created for you? Right? The one click checkout, as an example. Can't, you should always be trying to get to that. Um, business and pricing models. So I'm going to tell you that pricing models are hard. They're always hard. There's no one way to do them. Because the market tells you what you can charge. You have to be market-centric when you're developing pricing models. You have to consider what other people are paying. And when you're selling to folks, sell to them the way they're used to buying. One of the hardest things for people to grasp and over, to easily overlook is there may not be a line item in a budget at a company for what you're trying to sell them based on what you call it. Um, and again, people may not tell you that, 
but they'll just drag you along. So pay close attention to how, to how you sell to folks, what you sell and what you call it and how you position it because they may not have the same level of freedom as you do in just changing stories and changing the way they do business. They typically don't. Um, so so don't, don't lose sight of that either. Um, then you have to get heavily involved in how am I going to acquire these customers? What is my model? Am I, is it touchless online conversion, self-service? Is it light touch inside? Is it high touch inside? Is it, do I have to go out into the field and do this? Do I need a team? How long does it take me to acquire customers? Um, how much is it going to cost me to do that? Put all those units together, the cost for a lead, the, the fully burdened cost of the people that are doing it, and start to build out that model so you can understand whether or not you can actually make money doing what you're doing. Because if you're not charging more than you're, <laughs> than you're spending, at some point anyway, um, you know, then you're a nonprofit, and that's okay too, right? What's that? I love that. That's great. Um, so then it's data acquisition. That means I got to get a list of these people that I think can buy my stuff. How do I get that? And that's a big growth hacking component. There's a ton of different vendors and data acquisition resources in the marketplace. Um, and if you're looking for more information on that sort of stuff, saleshacker.com is a wonderful site to give you uh, information on data acquisition. Uh, on different sales technologies and tools. They've got a great community. Max Altshuler, who runs it, is a good friend. Um, there's, uh, there's a site called attach.io that has a list of all the different data acquisition and data management um, startups out there right now, including many of the ones that we use for our companies. Um, list brokers, they're a pain in the ass, but when you find a good one, you keep them. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can acquire data, right? You can build email lists, you can get phone lists, you can, you can obviously um, uh, uh, buy them, build them, rent them. Um, it just depends on what you're doing. But you have to come up with a plan to do that, and then you have to build a funnel associated with that because there's conversion rates. If I need five customers for my market milestone, I've got to reverse engineer the funnel. Based on my business, that means I need to talk to 100, or I need to talk to 50 or I need to build a list of 100, and I need to send to those 100, which means only 25 will reply, which means then that of those 25 that reply, I can only have 10 qualified conversations, which means I need to convert 10 of those conversations in order to get five customers. It truly does become a numbers game at that point if there's a market for what you're doing. So you have to build that out as well. Um, and then the messaging that we talked about. A couple of key things on messaging. Uh, value propositions and selling propositions are two different things. Don't tell people what you do. Tell them what you do for them. There's a big difference. Um, when my wife sends me to Home Depot to buy a quarter inch drill bit, it's not because I need a quarter inch hole in the wall. It's because I need to make her happy because she wants a picture hung right over here. right? And I recognize that. It's taken me 20 years to figure that out. but. Um, but, <laughs> but not everybody recognizes it a way and can, and can art properly articulate what they need. So it's your responsibility to do that. And how do you quantify value? You have to tie it to the business that they're in, and you have to tie it to money. In business, people only buy for one of four reasons. Make money, save money, create a competitive advantage, or stay out of prison. Um, and that's compliance. Right? When you're in a regulatory environment, things like insurance or things like that, that generate liability or, or minimize risk. So whatever you do, can you tie it to one or more of those four things if you're in business? And then if you're in, in business to business. If you're a business consumer, the fifth reason is emotion. So now you have to understand the personas and the behaviors and the psychology of the, of the individual buyer, the consumer buyer, and hit those points and figure out what those things are. And then selling props, get, you get into later, which is how you're different. But you don't do that until people actually give you the right. They ha you have to earn the right to gain their interest enough to get to that point. Um, so that's how you develop that initial traction framework that we we're talking about. And then you build the funnel. Um, you put the, the technology in place. Uh, then you figure out what you're truly trying to measure and you begin the outreach process. And then outreach is all about campaign creation, whether that's phone, email, 
Facebook, online, offline, some blended approach of what those things are. Every business has different ways of attracting customers. Um, if you find out what those are, look at what your competition does. Companies that have been successful in that market before, that'll give you a lot of good insights into how that works. Um, there are some more modern techniques like uh, mass personalized text-based outbound email um, that generates inbound interest and you work the replies with interest. Um, Predictable Revenue by my friend Aaron Ross is a great book if you're in business to business um, outbound marketing or sales. You can read that. It's very simple. It's easy. It gives you a good system and process to follow to generate leads using email, in it, but not the kind of email that we're all used to, not company to company, not some templated newsletter that gets stuck in a spam filter. Predictable revenue. Yeah. Um, it's about creating, using tools to create personalized emails that look like you spent the time to research one person, their company, and what they do, and you're reaching out to find out if they or somebody in their organization uh, is interested or in the market or handles what you do. And you will get a yield out of that. You know, it might be 5%, it might be 15, depending on your market and depending on how, how often this happens. But it actually works. It's a very effective way to generate warm interest in your business and eliminate traditional cold calling altogether. If you do it effectively, people will know who you are when you pick up the phone and call them. They'll have some understanding of what you do because they will have received these messages. And it's only spam if it's not relevant to a person. Um, but do it wisely, right? Fool with the tool, still a fool. Do it wisely, be respectful, test like everything else in small batches. You might run a test of 30 messages to see what works. Um, and there's some wonderful techniques for cold emailing out there that you can also find out about on Sales Hacker um, or salesfolk.com from, uh, from uh, Heather, uh, I forget Heather's last name, she does good, good work on that too. Teaches you how to write these things in a way that are quick, short, simple, pithy, and get a good response. Um, and then once you do that, you start that conversational framework that I mentioned. How do you enter a conversation with somebody who replies and says, ooh, that's interesting, tell me more. Don't just flail about and don't use scripts. I hate scripts. Scripts are one way. You use a conversational framework. I hypothesize this value. What would you like to get out of this conversation today? Here's what I would like to get. How do you do this? What are the problems associated with it? What's the impact on your business financially, economically, so that you can justify later the expense, right? And then do you have a need? Is it worth continuing this conversation more? Do you and I have to have another conversation? Do you want to see a demo? The last thing you do is demo your product. It's the last thing. Product demos suck because they're about your product. They're not about solving a problem for somebody else. First, you need to understand if they have a problem. And then when you do the demo, now you can tailor the demo for resonance. Now you can say, oh, remember you told me that was a problem? Well, here's how we solve it. And now it becomes real. And it makes the demo that much more effective. So resist vomiting about your product until you've had a conversation to understand what they do, how they do it, and whether or not you can solve for it. Right. Um, then opportunity framework is the next stage, which is, okay, now I've had conversations with five or ten people that I think actually might be interested in what we're doing. Are we qualifying them properly? Who else is involved in the process? Do you do strategic deal review? What are the user buyer types? You have the buyer types of user buyer, economic buyer, uh, technical buyer, champion. Have I checked off all the boxes? Have I had conversations with all these people? Do they all express that there's a need? Um, and now you start to be really honest with yourself and those around you. This is where you need to su curry support. You need to get other people involved in this process with you so that you're not biased to it, so that you are honest with yourself and those around you about whether or not this is a real thing. Um, and keep that pipeline clean. And depending on the business you're in, you're looking at this every day or you're looking at it worst every week as a group. And then you start to measure these things and you start to document and you behave in the ways that I talked about. Are we a learning organization? Are we tracking this stuff? Is it really working? What's working, what's not? What are the metrics that matter in my business? Um, then you look at every point in that process for the friction points. And this is where things get, I think, this is where the rubber really meets the road. There are certain deals in your pipeline that aren't moving. Why are they stuck? 
Um, are they stuck because they need more, they need case studies? I had a conversation this morning with somebody who was concerned that he wasn't able to get other customers. I said, are your current customers referenceable and do you have that story? He goes, they're referenceable, but I don't have the story yet. Go get the story. Then you can take it to the next person, right? Do those things, do them in order, identify at each stage in your sales process where the friction is and how to remove that friction. It's often sales tools, it's often unanswered questions, it's often concerns that these people have that we're not addressing. And by the way, I don't believe in objections and objection handling. Um, I believe that people have concerns, they need to be acknowledged, they need to be addressed, and they need to be resolved in order to do business with you. Because if they don't, they won't because we've all had those things where we swore up and down that this was gonna close. And then the guy went dark and what happened? And you have no idea why. Well, I'll tell you why. They either didn't recognize a need or you didn't resolve their concerns. It's one of those. And you have to be honest and go through that process together, okay? And then this is where we implement that product feedback loop that we talked about, where you've got a market development team and a product development team and they need to have these regular meetings Here's what the market is saying about our product. Here are the feature requests that they have. How does this fit into our roadmap? As the market development guy in a startup, you should know that roadmap cold. You should know the schedule, the release schedule. You should be able to speak to it. You should be able to understand when and where something new is going to be released and be able to set those expectations and then bring that information back from your market back to the product team and have honest discussions about, hey, where does this fit, right? And then as part of that qualifying process, will they pay us for this? Best thing in the world to do is you know, pay, have your customers pay for development that you can sell to other people. And if, if what you're doing is valuable, they will do it. And then it's talent acquisition framework. Okay, now who's gonna run this stuff? Who does what? And this is no small thing. Um, Building job descriptions that meet the requirements functionally as well as the attributes and the culture of your company. Making sure that you've got the right kind of compensation structures in place. Um, making sure that you start to break up and specialize the work at different stages based on the business and customer acquisition models that you have. Um, all of that has to be considered. That's why, we're, that's why we launched the academy. There aren't enough of these folks in the world. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's, that's super important. And then we document it all and we give, you know, you, you have a playbook that you can turn around and you can train people on how to do this stuff. And depending on the company in our situation, this thing can take anywhere from six weeks to 12 months. I think the longest we've been working, well, we've been working with, the, with one company for two years and we took them from six million and in, uh, in valuation and 30,000 a month in revenue to close to 3 million a month in revenue and close to $100 million valuation. Uh, different companies have different needs at different stages, um, but, but and this, this process can take a different length of time depending on those sales cycles. So what are the outcomes? What do we care about? Why do we do this, right? The whole start with why, I'm gonna end with why. Why, why not? Um, Okay, so the first thing we want to do is develop that roadmap. What's that? Simon Sinek. That's right, Simon. That's, yeah, Simon's a friend. That's why I'm making the joke. Um, <laughs> that's exactly right. If you haven't seen Start With Why, the TED Talk from Simon Sinek, you should, you should watch it. It's good. Um, yeah, the five whys is really good stuff. Anyway, um, so we want to map the organization. We want to prioritize things. We want to have an understanding of what it's, who our customers are and how we acquire them and how much revenue we can generate. We want to develop those hypotheses for each one. Uh, we want to have a comprehensive message map and strategy to talk to each one of those communities of people and those profiles and we want to be able to measure it. Um, then we want to build a portfolio of all the assets for outreach and execution, whether those are online and offline. Often again, one of these points that identifies friction in your funnel. We want to close the feedback loop and test the messaging everywhere. Um, again, it's one of those things that's easy to do if you're doing Facebook or Google. I'm going to test ad copy on two different things and I'm going to see which one generates a better response rate and I'm going to measure the cost, the acquire, and the CPA and all that. It's a lot harder to do when you're doing human customer acquisition, but you have to do it because sooner or later it's, somebody's going to ask you about it if, if you want their money. Um, so then we're going to measure and optimize and iterate on the messaging, validate the things that work and get rid of the things that don't and then create a recruitment marketing plan 
and job descriptions and everything that you need to make sure that you have the right people in place so that when we step away, you've got people who can run this um, and train it for the future. So um, that's our process. It's, as investors, it's fully aligned with outcomes, but this is the way that you can think about how to get your product to market because any new company is a new product. And this doesn't just work, by the way, for startups. Uh, it works in big companies as well. It works anywhere where a new product to a new market needs to go. Okay. Um, that's a case study of, I think, the one I was just talking about, um, Cargo Chief, a, uh, a, uh, an online marketplace that connects domestic freight shippers with domestic freight carriers and how we took them from a $6 million valuation to a $100 million valuation and, and, uh, and 10x their, 100x their revenue. Um, but anyway, uh, 18 months, yeah. Different markets, different businesses, you never know. When they started, they had one salesperson, and I think they're up to about 40 or 50 now, and they've got offices in Chicago and, and Dallas and, and in the Bay Area now. <laughs> but that's a classic example of a company where we took their cost to acquire a customer down 80% by using outbound email to generate interest instead of expensive field salespeople and then use that to create conversations that convert it, um, which is a new thing to a traditional industry like freight shipping, mm -hmm. where the people that ship are knocking on your doors and they're walking up and down the street and having conversations with you and those people are expensive and they cost a certain amount of money to keep them and their families fed. Whereas if you could reach out to these people in another medium and get them to reply, with interest, then you can pick up the phone and have more targeted conversations that are more efficient. Um, and that's, that's part of, of, uh, of what we've done in that, in that case. So I'll, uh, thank you for that. I'll open it up to questions and conversation. I appreciate y'all listening. <laughs>